I've been waiting almost three and a half years to be able to do this particular video. So about two months ago, my study, my research project, got published. So that was really cool to actually have a research project officially published in a pretty reputable journal. So my study is called A Descriptive Analysis of Shoulder Muscle Activities During Individual Stages of the Turkish Get-Up Exercise. That is a very long title, but it pretty much is what it is. So I did a descriptive analysis of shoulder muscle activities during the Turkish get-up exercise. Now I have a few different reasons why we decided to investigate this exercise in particular. The glenohumeral joint, this joint right here, your main shoulder joint, is the most commonly dislocated joint in the entire body. So in the health field and the fitness field, there's a lot of interest in finding exercises to really strengthen the shoulder to either prevent uh, dislocations from happening or rehabbing a shoulder dislocation. Now there are many exercises out there that have been geared especially towards like the rotator cuff muscles to strengthen those and in turn help to stabilize the glenohumeral joint. So we have our banded external rotation exercises, internal rotation, external rotation, all of those types of things are great for strengthening your rotator cuff. Recently in the health and fitness world, there's been a shift in gearing towards using exercises that are very multi-planar and multi-joint. And the idea is that it'll that using exercises like this will help to transfer into more functional type of activities. And the Turkish get-up exercise is an example of such an exercise. Now for those who are not familiar with the Turkish get-up exercise, it's an exercise most commonly performed with a kettlebell where you start off from the floor and then you go through seven stages to end up standing upright with the kettlebell overhead. Then you perform those same stages in reverse. So those stages are you're laying on your back, then you go to the elbow press, then to the elbow support, then the hand support, then we go to the high bridge, the leg sweep, the half kneeling, to the standing. Then we perform all those stages in reverse order and that would be considered one repetition with the exercise. Now a lot of healthcare professionals and fitness professionals are using the Turkish get-up exercise with hopes of stabilizing the shoulder. Now that makes sense because a lot of the muscles that are involved or seemingly involved with the um, this exercise are crossing the shoulder joint so theoretically any one of those muscles can help contribute or not contribute to stabilize the shoulder. Now, in the literature, there's zero, zero articles that are actually investigating the Turkish get-up exercise. And we can make inferences as to what the shoulder, what the muscles are actually doing, but without directly measuring them, it's hard to know for sure. So we had two major goals for this study. One was to describe the activity patterns of the sh of some of the shoulder muscles that are crossing the shoulder during the individual stages of the Turkish get-up exercise. And two was to actually compare left and right side and both in the up and down phases of this exercise. Methods. Now every good project needs to have subjects and subjects are the people who you are doing the experiment on. Now for our project we chose 12 individuals, 6 male and 6 female. Now the criteria were that they had to have had been performing the Turkish get ups exercise for at least a year, so they need to be experienced with this particular exercise. And they also have to be asymptomatic, meaning they don't have any pain anywhere or have any current injuries or have not had any for the last six months. After our subjects were recruited into the study, we brought them into the laboratory went over the proper consent form. Next, we had them actually perform one or two practice reps of the Turkish get-up exercise. So this allowed them to warm up a little bit and get ready for the actual trials. Next, what we did was the EMG instrumentation. So the EMG is a little sensor that we stick onto the skin and it's essentially a sensor that will let us measure how much muscle activity is going on underneath. Now the muscles that we chose to investigate were the pec major, the anterior delt, the bicep, the tricep, the posterior delt, upper trapezius, infraspinatus, and latissimus dorsi. And yes, I've been, I need to read off of things because I don't remember off of them off the top of my head. So knowing my anatomy, I put those service EMGs over the muscle belly of each one of those muscles. The next thing that we did after that was measure our maximum voluntary contraction, meaning that we took each one of those muscles and we squeezed them 
to 100% of the person's max. So that way we can measure to see, okay, this muscle has this much activity. So now when we do the exercise, the Turkish get up exercise, we can actually measure how much activity is going on compared to their own max. So now that we did this for both sides, we had the person go back on the floor, grab another kettlebell and do one or two more practice trials with all the instruments on them. So they just get, a, get an idea how they're gonna move with all the stuff on them. And after that, when they felt they were ready, that's when we started our actual trials. So they did a total of 10 trials and they had a good two minute rest in between each one. So after two minutes, the muscles are fairly recuperated, so to speak, from the previous trials and they're ready to go again. So like I mentioned previously, we actually are categorizing how much muscle activity is going on in each individual stages of the Turkish getup. Now, how did we measure this? The machine that measures the muscle activity um, doesn't necessarily categorize or delineate kind of when each individual stages are happening of the Turkish get because that's something that I was very interested in. So the machine that measures that really just has a start, an end, and all the data in between. Now because I wanted to figure out what was going on in each individual stage, what we did is a time sync video meaning that I took a video recording of each one of the trials and synced the video to the data being collected at the same time. So then later on, I can actually review the video and put in the time codes of when each individual stage is starting and ending and then sync that to the data that was collected. So then we can actually measure what's going on in each individual stages. All of this EMG data combined with all the time codes, we're able to figure out the amount of activity that's going on in each individual stage. Now, thankfully my thesis advisor is really good at this data stuff and coding and all those things like that. So he kind of took all that data that I kind of gathered and ran with it. And this is what we got. So what we calculated essentially is the area under the curve. So the area under the curve uh, essentially what we call integrated EMG in this particular case. Simply put, integrated EMG is a measure of the overall muscle activity during a particular time. And the particular time in these cases are the individual stages of the Turkish get-up exercise. Results. So after all that work, all that data processing, we're able to actually have data to work with and start to interpret them. Some of the key things that we found in the study. The greatest amount of muscle activity happened in the second stage, the press to elbow support stage, and the fifth leg sweep stage. Now it goes without saying also that throughout the entire exercise, the stages in which the right side is moving, the left side is not moving, the right side is activated more, and that should be a no-brainer. Right. So what was kind of neat also was that in stages four and five, the one where is the high bridge and the leg sweep, the left side, the uninvolved side, the side that's not touching the kettlebell directly, had about 42% greater activity compared to the right side during those two stages. The one muscle that had the most activity throughout the entire exercise was the right triceps, so the side that was holding the kettlebell and the overall muscle that had the most activity on the left side is your latissimus dorsi. Now when comparing the concentric phase and the eccentric phase, so the up and down, they're more or less the same. However, there were some key differences between them. A lot of them uh, had to do with the amount of activity. So overall, on the eccentric portion, on stages one, two, and three of those, there was about 29% less activity overall compared to the, their concentric portion. So these results are pretty interesting actually, you know, we don't really really think about the left side, the uninvolved side, being so active during this exercise. We're really, in my experience anyways, when we're kind of coaching this drill and we're really, um, you know, talking about this exercise, most of the people really think about the involved side, so the side that the kettlebell is holding, you know, we're, we're taught to look at that kettlebell during the entire time. So we're really focused on that side and often not thinking about the other side, but our data shows that the other side is actually working quite a bit. So when we're doing this exercise, really consider performing this exercise on both sides. Now we talked a lot about joint stability earlier, and that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to uh, investigate this particular exercise. Joint stability is a lot harder to measure than you may realize. We have to combine the 
kinetic data, so the amount of muscle activity that's going on, but also our kinematic data. And our kinematic data really more so refers to joint positioning, um, all those things, how those forces are acting on each other. So there's a lot of different variables involved. Now with our particular study, we only had the means to measure the kinetic data, so the amount of muscle activity that's going on. Kinetic data is a great starting point to give us a really good idea of what muscles are activating in what quantities and in what stages of this exercise. But unfortunately, without that kinematic data, uh, we're not able to certainly address the, uh, the subject of joint stability because we're missing another piece of the equation here. So that was one of the draw the unfortunate drawbacks with our studies that we couldn't definitely comment on the joint stability portion of this exercise. Now comparing some of our data from the Turkish get up exercise to other exercises for let's say rotator cuff and we actually know how much activity is going on in those muscles, those comparisons uh, can be useful if we're really trying to be specific on a particular muscle group. Those comparisons can be useful if the objective is of a particular muscle group for a particular purpose, such as rehabbing a muscle strain or rehabbing after an injury or strengthening a particular muscle. Making direct inferences between different exercises can be difficult without the corresponding biomechanical information uh, and kinematic data, essentially. So take that into consideration as well. But it might be interesting to still, using your good judgment anyways, um, implement some of these this exercise uh, in addition to or taking away from another exercise so that we are now training the shoulder in a more functional manner versus just a isolation exercise. Like I mentioned we have some limitations in this particular study because we don't have when we don't have our kinematic data we're just not able to measure those. Another limitation for our study is that we told the participants, all of our subjects, to perform the ticker get up at their own pace. Now, as we know in strength and conditioning and all those things, that if we vary the speed of the exercise, we can get different types of muscle activity, either more or less. Conclusion. So the data from our current investigation can help provide some insight as to what are some of the necessary neuromuscular demands to accomplish an overhead activity such as the Turkish get up exercise. You know, it can also help provide a little bit of insight to implementing the Turkish get up into somebody's training program or even into the latter stages of a shoulder rehabilitation, for example. Now again, in our particular study, we only used healthy subjects. So any health professionals out there who want to use this exercise with your patient, please be aware, use your good judgment. And based on this literature, it's feasible to use this in the latter stages of rehabilitation of a shoulder injury. But again, please use your good judgment when you're doing this with your patient. Now some other key points for our strength and conditioning professionals. Be aware that the neuromuscular control strategies at a given stage of the Turkish get up exercise is not necessarily the same for the up and down portions. And remember that the contralateral side, the side that's not touching the kettlebell, is actually quite heavily involved in this exercise. So really consider training both sides when implementing this exercise with your clients. So that's pretty much it. This took a lot of work to do this exercise. Uh, I really have a brand new appreciation for researchers who do this stuff every day. Uh, and I can tell you that this stuff is really, really hard to do. So if you like this video, got something out of it, please hit the like button. I would really, really appreciate it. Please subscribe to my channel. If you want to read this full text, I put the link in the description below. You can go on the journal's website and actually read the article for yourself. So until next time, take care.